of a freer and more open society in England in the 18th century allowed her businessmen to begin the first industrial revolution. But on the continent, government restrictions on freedom delayed industrialization. In the hundred years after 1750, England developed an economy of such unparalleled productivity that it became known as the workshop of the world. The third and final film in this series is concerned with the effects of industrialization upon the lives of ordinary people. Was the Industrial Revolution a good or a bad thing for most people? For example, was it as bad as the elder Arnold Toynbee declared? A period as disastrous and terrible as any through which a nation ever passed. Side by side with a great increase in wealth was seen an enormous increase in pauperism. Production on a large scale led to a rapid alienation of classes and the degradation of a large body of producers. Toynbee wrote in 1883, but already in 1830 there had been a fierce debate about the consequences of the Industrial Revolution between Robert Southey, the poet laureate, and Lord Macaulay, the historian. Southey had written, The immediate and home effect of the manufacturing system is to produce physical and moral evil in proportion to the wealth which it creates. Macaulay disagreed and argued that since 1800, we must confess ourselves unable to find any satisfactory record of any great nation, past or present, in which the working classes have been in a more comfortable situation than in England. The serving man, the artisan, and the husbandman have a more copious and palatable supply of food, better clothing, and better furniture. The same disagreement can be found today. When Nobel Prize winner Bertrand Russell wrote, The Industrial Revolution caused unspeakable misery, both in England and America. Nobel Prize winner F.A. Hayek replied, but this view is based on a myth. The legend of the deterioration of the position of the working classes in consequence of the rise of the industrial system. Such disagreement between such distinguished scholars has caused confusion among students. No wonder an American historian has declared there was probably never a more blatant case in the history of economics of two opposing schools of thought derived from a single set of phenomena. We asked Professor R.M. Hartwell of the University of Oxford for his view of this great debate. To me, the debate is a strange one because it is based on an apparent paradox, a massive increase in the production of goods and services relatively to population along with an alleged reduction in the standard of living. To settle the issue, we must look to the facts of history. As this worker's cottage here in the north of England Open Air Museum demonstrates, the facts of history are against those who believe that living standards moved downwards during the Industrial Revolution. On the contrary, the facts of history show that between 1750 and 1850, average real income per head in England increased between 50 and 100%. Over the entire 19th century, there was a fourfold increase. When these figures are translated into goods, the most obvious change was in the amount and the variety of consumer goods available to the English people. Comparing the 18th with the 19th century, there was a general change from a meagerness of personal possessions and a low consumption to a growing ownership of possessions and a higher consumption. The Great Exhibition, with its 17,000 exhibits, demonstrated the choices of a consumer-oriented society. England, in its profusion and diversity of goods, had become the first consumer society, a society in which production was geared to consumer satisfaction and in which consumer choice was greatly extended. The Industrial Revolution was a revolution in production, and it is relevant to ask what happened to the goods produced. The answer is that the great bulk of these products were consumed by the British people themselves, supplemented by an ever-increasing stream of imports. 
and increasing consumption was not confined to manufactured goods. Comparing eating habits in the 1850s, a contemporary observer concluded, how much better an Englishman is fed than anyone else in the world. Grain and meat production in Britain, for example, kept pace with the growth of population. And diversity of produce was increased with the expansion of orchards and market gardens, for example, in the Thames Valley near London. And with the growth of the fishing industry, especially in the North Sea, imports further expanded the quantity and variety of foods available, increasing the consumption of beverages, tea, coffee and cocoa. Large imports of rice and currants, for example, supplemented the domestic production of grain and fruit. By 1840, large quantities of perishable foods, livestock, poultry, meat, butter, cheese and eggs, were imported regularly from abroad. By 1850, the Londoner, on average, was consuming each week five ounces of butter, 30 ounces of meat, 56 ounces of potatoes, and 16 ounces of fruit. This compares favorably with the British average consumption in 1960 of five ounces of butter, 35 ounces of meat, 51 ounces of potatoes, and 32 ounces of fruit. Consumption of basic foods in London in 1850, therefore, was similar to that of modern Britain. And there's no reason to think that the Englishman outside of London ate less well. So with other commodities. Furniture. China pottery and earthenware. Pots and pans, iron goods and cutlery. Coal for domestic use. Clothing and footwear. Boots began to take the place of clogs and hats replaced shawls, at least on Sundays. Pictures and ornaments. Books and magazines. The working class home, which before the Industrial Revolution had contained so little, now began to have its inventory. Most of the production of the Industrial Revolution was of consumer goods for the mass of the people. These people also were better housed. As the population of England and Wales increased from 9 million in 1801 to 18 million in 1851, there was a corresponding increase in the stock of houses. And as the census statistics show, there was a reduction in the number of persons per inhabited house. Most of the housing built during the Industrial Revolution consisted of substantial dwellings for the working classes. And the quality of housing, physical and architectural, can be seen today in the industrial areas of Lancashire and Yorkshire, in the Welsh mining villages, and in London and other ports. Such houses, maligned by some historians as the cruel habitations of the poor, are now sought after by the middle classes as desirable residences. There were certainly slums in the congested and poorer suburbs of the cities. But these slums were in specific areas where a minority of the poorest of working people lived. There was no more a general housing problem during the Industrial Revolution than there was a general food problem. But there was still poverty, and the very poor could afford only the meanest of accommodation, often in slums. The majority of the working people of the Industrial Revolution, however, were well housed, and some occupied houses often built by their employers, but are now recognized as architectural gems. The rapid expansion of cities also created problems of sanitation and water supply, which for a time threatened the health of Britain's rapidly expanding population. But industrialization, which had produced these difficulties, at the same time provided the solution. Much 19th century ingenuity went into the solution of the sanitary problem, as it was called. This took the form mainly of adequate supplies of pure water. This depended, however, on technical advances. Waterworks and reservoirs on a large scale, often with steam pumping engines, iron conduit pipes, sewage systems, 
and ceramic tiles for sanitary purposes. And if the engineers solved the technical problems, it was a combination of private and municipal initiative which solved the problems of finance and organization. Prompted by self-interest and a sense of civic duty, individuals and local authorities were improving public health from the beginning of the 19th century through an increasing range of services. Your water supplies, street cleaning and paving, public baths and washhouses, and public parks. The statistics of population growth reflected the improvements in living standards and in private and public health. As a measure of increasing well-being, there was a fall in infant mortality rates from 180 per thousand at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to 150 by 1840. At the same time, there was a slowly increasing life expectancy as the death rate went down from 25 to 22 per thousand. The result of these population trends, which included a rise in the birth rate stimulated by increasing economic opportunities, was a massive and unprecedented increase in population, the population explosion. We asked Professor Ronald Coase of the University of Chicago to comment. To many contemporaries, this rise of population was seen not as a beneficial addition to the number of potential producers, but as a threat to living standards, as a growing population pressed on resources. This vision of infinite population growth in a finite world was made explicit by the Reverend Robert Malthus in his widely read essay on population, published in 1798. Malthus predicted a general struggle for existence as population increased faster than the supply of food. His argument was a simple one. Though the produce of the earth would be increasing every year, population would have the power of increasing much faster. The tendency of population to increase beyond the means of subsistence may be seen in almost every register of a county parish in the kingdom. The unavoidable effect of this tendency to depress the whole body of the people in want and misery is equally obvious. Malthus theories made a great impression, in part no doubt because the accurate counting of the population in the first three censuses of the 19th century confirmed that population was in fact increasing very rapidly. From 1801 to 1831, the population rose from 11 millions to 16 millions. By 1851, the population was about 21 millions. From 1781, the population increased by over 10% per decade. At its peak rate, between 1811 and 1821, it increased by 17%. These figures were high but the British population increase occurred in an economy that was industrializing rapidly, in which the proportion of the population working in agriculture was declining, and in which output per head was greatly increasing. The British pattern contrasted markedly with that of Ireland between 1750 and 1850, where there was a rapid growth of population without industrialization, culminating in a Malthusian crisis in the 1840s, the Great Famine. As T.S. Ashton, the greatest modern historian of the Industrial Revolution, has written, Ireland lost in the 40s about a fifth of her people by emigration or starvation and disease. If England had remained a nation of cultivators and craftsmen, she could hardly have escaped the same fate. And at best, the weight of a growing population must have pressed down the spring of her spirit. She was delivered not by her rulers, 
but by those who, seeking no doubt their own narrow ends, have the wit and resources to devise new instruments of production and new methods of administering industry. There are today on the plains of India and China men and women, plague-ridden and hungry, living lives little better to outward appearance than those of the cattle that toil with them by day and share their places of sleep at night. Such Asiatic standards and such unmechanized horrors are the lot of those who increase their numbers without passing through an industrial revolution. If the standard of living was rising, however, it was not rising quickly enough to be plainly obvious to everyone. Any individual worker was aware only that his wages were not sufficient to satisfy his wants. As the English statistician A.L. Bowley has pointed out, the idea of progress is largely psychological and certainly relative. People are apt to measure their progress, not from a forgotten position in the past, but towards an ideal which, like an horizon, continually recedes. The present generation is not interested in the earlier needs and successes of its progenitors, but in its own distresses and frustrations, considered in the light of the presumed possibility of universal comfort or riches. Yes, there was discontent, based not only on this psychological reason, but on frustration, because industrialization did have its casualties, especially those workers displaced by machinery, like the cotton handloom weavers. There were also fluctuations in trade and hence employment that caused great hardship. Some workers reacted violently, like the Luddites who smashed machinery, but these were a minority and a minority that declined. Most workers accepted industrialization and its opportunities and sought to resolve their grievances by forming trade unions and by working for a more representative parliament. The important thing about economic grievances during the Industrial Revolution was that industrialization itself provided the solution, increasing productivity leading to increasing real incomes and widening job opportunities. And for all social problems, the success of industrialization bred a new attitude towards the possibilities of progress. Social ills were seen not as old ills to be endured, but as new ills to be remedied either by private or public action. And there is impressive evidence of this new concern, not only in the founding of a myriad of charitable institutions, but in parliamentary inquiries into social problems, inquiries that were published and now fill large sections of our public libraries. Child labour, for example, which had been accepted over history as inescapable, even desirable, now came to be seen as socially unacceptable in a civilised society. Publicised by humanitarians, investigated by parliament, child labour was reduced by legislative action. There is probably no other aspect of the Industrial Revolution which rouses so much passion and compassion as the employment of children in factories. The social historians J.L. and B. Hammond have written about children that stunted, diseased, deformed, degraded, each with the tale of his wronged life, they pass across the stage a living picture of man's cruelty to man a pitiless indictment of those rulers who in their days of unabated power had abandoned the weak to the rapacity of the strong. Here we have one of the most contentious points in the great debate, child labor. How true is that picture the Hammonds give? Children certainly worked during the Industrial Revolution, but the picture of a new and undesirable phenomenon peculiar to industrialization has to be modified in several ways. In the first place, child labor was not new. It is as old as history. For example, it was essential for the domestic system of production which preceded industrialization. Indeed, it was only during the Industrial Revolution that child labor was first criticized. The response of an industrializing society to the employment of children was to reduce or abolish it. Secondly, the employment of children in agriculture continued during and after the Industrial Revolution. 
As the Oxford economic historian J. E. Thorold Rogers wrote in 1888, The work of the child in the fields, ill-fed, poorly clothed, and exposed to the worst weather in the worst time of the year was to the full as physically injurious as premature labor in the heated atmosphere of the factory. Thirdly, those opposed to factory legislation had little difficulty in disproving general complaints of cruelty, overwork, bad health, and declining morals. There were individual cases of hardship, but the critics of the factory employment of children exaggerated their claims. And historians have since shown that much of their evidence was biased, depicting the worst rather than the best or the typical. Most children were not badly treated nor permanently harmed by their experience in the factories. My fourth and last point is one of common sense. The responsibility for children working rested more with parents than with employers. And it is difficult to argue that the majority of parents did not care about the working conditions of their children and that they were prepared to accept excessive work and cruelty. Some historians have criticized the rulers of Britain during the Industrial Revolution for their indifference to social problems. The same historians get their evidence for this alleged indifference from the official papers which were generated by Parliament in an effort to understand and solve such problems. Rulers and employers in the 19th century combined humanitarianism with a high sense of social duty, which reflected itself in legislation to remedy social problems and in action by individual employers to improve the wages and living conditions of their workforce. This beneficial concern could still be seen, for example, in such model industrial villages as Saltaire, built by the mill owner Titus Salt, and style village in Cheshire, built by the mill owner Samuel Gregg. Industrialization meant increasing real incomes, higher incomes meant widening life choices. And so self-help and voluntary effort were basic to personal progress. This can be seen clearly in education, where there was little public provision before 1870, yet widespread literacy. A private schooling system had developed over the period of the Industrial Revolution, which had doubled literacy rates with little help from the state, and had made England as literate as other European countries where extensive state educational systems already existed. The Industrial Revolution was accompanied by an educational revolution without the help of the state. 19th century England was rich in voluntary organisations with a wide range of social purposes in medicine, education, religion, housing and recreation, for example. Organisations which drew deeply on the wealth of the middle and upper classes and often combined employer and worker in common purpose. Other working class organisations flourished besides trade unions. Friendly societies, educational and political societies, cooperatives, which not only increased the self-respect but also the political and industrial power of working people. This largely explains the political stability of 19th century Britain. The majority of workers, as a result of being better fed, better housed and better educated, were less degraded than in previous periods. They were also less violent, and this from choice, not from coercion. Only an observer as insensitive to the character of the English working people as Frederick Engels could have imagined seriously that they were desperate and revolutionary as a result of industrialization. Engels wrote in his The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844 that the working people of England had been so exploited that revolution more bloody than the French Revolution was inevitable. It is particularly easy to forecast future events in England because in that country every aspect of social development is so plain and clear cut. The revolution must come. The revolution, however, never came. Engels was as incorrect in his diagnosis of present ills as in his prophecy of general insurrection. And so he spent the rest of his life explaining the failure of his prophecy. And when he died in 1894, he was still 
prophesying revolution. What actually happened was the peaceful transformation of society in the context of increasing wealth and of increasing participation by all citizens in the political and economic development of the country. The predictions of declining living standards and of political violence were never fulfilled. Most British workers accepted industrialization because it gave them more opportunities for wealth and social advancement. As the economist J.M. Keynes pointed out, Escape from the working classes was possible for any man of capacity or character at all exceeding the average into the middle and upper classes. The fact that wealth and social betterment were possible provided the obvious spur to effort. Personal advancement before the Industrial Revolution had been dependent mainly on birth, on favor, or corruption. Now it was available, if not to all, at least to enough working people to justify hard work, thrift, and ambition as social virtues. And ordinary people came to enjoy a standard of living which in earlier ages would have been undreamed of. It was, as J.M. Keynes declared, a magnificent century.